Hi, this is Paul, March 2019, and the title is Northrop Frye, Pluses and Minuses. Though I do not agree with Northrop Frye in many areas, I would like to start with some pluses. The first has to do with a statement he made on page 91 of his book, The Great Code, and I've got the reference down there at the bottom. Here's the quotation. Even more significant is that Jesus' claim that he was a real king, though of a spiritual kingdom, not of this world, while at the same time behaving like a servant and identifying himself with the least of others, Matthew 25, is intended, among other things, to resolve the master-slave dialectic on which the whole of human history turns. His words intended to resolve master-slave dialectic is abstruse, but he was pointing, and perhaps unwittingly, to the wonderful truth that Jesus was and is both the king creator of the universe and also earth's God-appointed slave who humbled himself to the point of dying on a cross for wretched sinners like Fry, you, and me. Earlier in the book, page 73, he wrote that the King James Version translates the term Ionios as everlasting and eloquent testimony to the limitations of language. Continuing with the quotation, hell thus became, for latter, later Christianity, a hopelessly mixed metaphor meaning a world of ex externally applied torture going on endlessly in time. This is a plus. Why? Though he's not quite right about the limitations of language aspect, he nevertheless was pointing to something worthwhile, connecting the Greek Ionius with the King James mistranslation, everlasting. The Greek word is equivalent to the Hebrew word olam, also mentioned by Fry, page 124, and neither means everlasting. Both words mean lasting where the span can be can accommodate either temporal or eternal durations. Our language on this point, therefore, is not limited. Remember his phrase, uh, the limitations of language. Because the English has a very good word for both Ionius and Olam, and that word is lasting. And there is a lasting Bible published last uh, month. Uh, I'm sorry, last year, 2018, and you can get a free digital copy with no charge at all if you go to CR Ministries' webpage. In the front, top of every page, just click where it says you can get the Lasting Bible. <clears throat> and that book on the left, which you can see a bit bigger picture of in the previous slide, is actually a book that I wrote about the word Ionius, the very word that I was talking about. I plan to get to some other almost pluses near the end, but choose now to present some minuses. For I wrote that there is no real evidence for the life of Jesus outside the New Testament. The two testaments form a double mirror, each reflecting the other, but neither the world outside. In other words, the New Testament doesn't reflect the world outside, and the Old Testament doesn't either. This is absurd, as there are many artifacts outside the Bible that reflect life inside the Bible, including inscribed names on bullae of Judean kings and or scribes. Hezekiah, for example, is one. The name of David and Pilate carved on ancient stones, and also a ring. You can see a picture of it there found at the Herodian fortress with the Greek word Pilatus on it. 
Pontius Pilate was the Roman ruler granting permission for Jesus to be crucified. Other reflections include the Dead Sea Scrolls, revealing fidelity in transmission over centuries, the Pool of Gibeon, uncovered because the Bible said it was there. That was Dr. Pritchard at University of Pennsylvania wrote a book about it. And he believed that there was a pool there because, and he went and dug and found it. Hezekiah's tunnel is also, my wife and I have gone through that tunnel. And that's mentioned in the Bible. The pool of Siloam, where Jesus healed the blind men. Even a coin in my own collection there on the right which was found on the Mount of Olives and dating to around 6 AD, it refers to Ethnarch Archelaus. You can see the word, the, first, the Greek letters E-T-H, uh, theta there in the middle and so on. Part of it is missing. It's a bronze cone, so it's, it's crude. But nevertheless, it's there and it's a certified cone. I mean, there are various cones like it and they're all in the same category. And Ar Archelaus is mentioned explicitly in the New Testament. Regarding the life of Jesus outside the Bible and responding to that part of Fry's comment, uh, are we to reject the writings of early church fathers as well as Josephus, Tacitus, Pliny, and the Babylonian Talmud and Lucian? Fry seems to be parroting the liberal scholar negative bias line. But that is no excuse. He is responsible for what he wrote. Earlier on page 34, he wrote, but myth and literature are already inextricably, I'm sorry, inextricable in the Gilgamesh epic, which is much older than any part of the Bible as they are in Homer, who is roughly contemporary with the older parts of the New, uh, Old Testament. Really? Was Homer, who may have been born around 800 BC, a contemporary of Moses? Moses composed the first five books of the Bible around 1400 BC. That's 600 years before Homer. Job, author of his book, may have lived around 2000, roughly contemporary with the writing of Gilgamesh. There is also some evidence that Moses, when he wrote, the first five books actually may have had documents, tablets himself, predating him. Consider Abraham. He was 2000 uh, B.C. Or Noah, just roughly speaking, 3000 B.C. And or even Adam, again, roughly speaking, 5000 to 4000 B.C. Did Gilgamesh live before Adam? That's absurd. Many others writing under the Spirit's direction cannot be ruled out. Fry had bought into the documentary hypothesis, secular evolutionary approach to Old Testament compilation, but there are many scholars who reject that hypothesis. Meredith Klein, one of my former professors at Westminster, affirmed, quote, beyond the prologue, Genesis is divided into ten sections, each introduced by a superscription embodying the formula Elatola Dote. Uh, in other words, maybe there were various people participating in the formation of Genesis. These are the generations of, that's what Elatola Dote means. The placing of the entire Genesis narrative in this genealogical framework is a clear sign that the author intended the account to be understood throughout as a real life history of individual men, begotten and begetting. This genealogical line is resumed in subsequent biological historiography. The Genesis list being recapitulated and carried forward until the lineage of Adam uh, has been traced to Jesus. Genesis 26 says, And in your offspring, God is speaking, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So it's not just Jews, it's people all over the world are going to be blessed. But then it goes on and says, Because Abraham, now this is before Moses, Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. 
Abraham was 600 years before Moses and 1,200 years before Homer. Did he have written commandments, statutes, and laws that eventually were passed on to Moses? I don't rule that out. Even Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, you can sort of see a picture there uh, from the, I think, the movie, the, the film, The Ten Commandments. There's Charlton Heston on the left and so on, and Jethro, the father-in-law. Is it possible that Jethro, uh, a priest who loved God, we're told, might have had some records he passed on to his son-in-law? Noah actually survived the flood, reported in the Gilgamesh epic. Gilgamesh, therefore, was a descendant of one of Noah's three sons. Fry's exaltation of Gilgamesh chronology over the Bible is weak. Two pages later, Fry wrote, Perhaps there is a collective unconscious with a flood archetype in the middle of it, as for all I know there may be. Fry thus was willing to account for all of the documentation about a global flood from both inside and outside the Bible as some kind of collective unconscious. If many cultures, however, report a global flood, why would it be illogical to consider that all descendants of Noah, spreading worldwide, would remember and even record about the global trauma their parents told them about, one they actually went through? God has even supplied megatons of buried animal remains in fossil record, confirming all the more the inscribed cultural traditions, including the Gilgamesh epic. On page 39, he wrote, They resemble other creation and deluge myths over the world and are not the oldest forms we have of such myths. Well, I've already dealt with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's got a bias and so on. He thinks that these predate the Old Testament and all that. But it's Joseph's willingness to trust secular, in other words, unbelieving, assessments of chronology. If the Bible is right that man is in rebellion, they were their people lie about the past. Trusting sinful men is unwise, especially where there is an anti-God bias present. Moreover, flood geology was the prevailing scientific theory prior to uniformitarianism. Take a look at that uh, fossilized tree st spanning a number of layers and so on, which supposedly are laid down over millions of years and so on. There's so much more evidence I could go on and on. On page 41, he wrote, And just as the historical books of the Old Testament are not history, so the Gospels are not biography. I've already addressed this above, but there is a huge history in both Testaments. Moreover, the Bible is full of biography. The oldest manuscript for Julius Caesar um, uh, it's about 900 years after the events. But the Gospels and about Jesus and Paul, uh, Paul's letters were written less than 70 years after, much less than 900 years. On page 107, Fry wrote, God is male because that rationalizes the ethos of the patriarchal male-dominated society. Death came with the fall be because... That rationalizes a very primitive feeling that death, the most natural and inevitable of all events, is still somehow unnatural in the older or Yahwist account of the creation which begins in Genesis 2. I'm sure that many of you didn't quite follow what he was saying, but this is has many faults. Concerning death, for example, being the most natural of all events, it was and is extremely unnatural. Death was a judgment on life, death being the opposite. Statistically, we all die, to be sure, but death is our enemy. Also, Fry's Yaoist, and later he talked about the priestly documents, confirms his commitment to the documentary hypothesis, which was, is a massive, evolutionary-based, poisonous, fraud. Darwin, the author of evolutionism, ultimately, or, well, actually preceded him, 
even promoted the nonsense about blacks supposedly being closer to guerrillas than whites. The Ku Klux Klan, KKK people, were followers of Darwin, as were both Hitler and Stalin. It's sad that Fry apparently also was at least indirectly a follower of Darwin as, as he uh, embraced the documentary hypothesis. He even seemed to reject the very existence of God notion, page 112, and I'm quoting him, we should be more inclined now to reverse the analogy and say that the conception of God as creator is a projection, projection from the fact that man makes things. In other words, God, man is projecting God. The argument from design, continuing with Fry, the argument from design did not survive the evolutionary structures of thought in the 19th century. But this projection motif is cyanide, and the design motif is very much alive today. There's Anthony Flew, who described himself, thought of him as an atheist. But he, after learning about the complexity of the DNA, he became a theist. That's how complex it is. So much for the fact that the design thing has been rejected. Take a look at this book by Stephen Meyer, Dr. Dr. Meyer's Signature of the Cell. Uh, DNA, Evidence for Intelligent Design. On page 230, we're getting close to the end here, Fry wrote that nobody understands what death means. Is this because Fry really did not believe Jesus conquered death on the third day after his crucifixion? Jesus fully understands death. He was there, did that. He also came back and gave his followers, notice two disciples on the road to Emmaus there after the resurrection. He gave his followers much instruction and later when the disciples gathered, read Luke 24 about what had happened to him. He explained it. Before going to some quasi-pluses, I offer a partial list of other untruths seen in Fry's book. We don't have time to go into it, but uh, Christianity supposedly rejects the Jewish, Jewish law, page 75, that the fall is to be understood as frustrated sex, page 149, that Cain got his wife from nowhere, page 144, that Jacob Esau caused the shift from hunting to food gathering, page 150, that neither Matthew 2 nor Hosea really are about, uh, 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 about Jesus, page 172, that Adam was second, not last, page 176, that Jephthah killed his daughter, page 185, that Jesus did not ascend, page 193, that Luke did not, was not the author of the third gospel called by the name Luke, and that Isaiah did not, was not the author of all of Isaiah. So where did Cain get his wife? But the Bible says plainly that Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. It's such, a, such an easy thing to answer that. This next is quasi plus. Fry quoted Milton, and that was a plus. I like. There's a picture of Milton there dictating. He was blind, I think, uh, or something, and he was dictating to his uh, three daughters. And this is what Milton said: "It is difficult," says, Mil says Milton, "to conjure the purpose of providence in committing the writings of the New Testament such to such uncertain and variable guardianship." A statement. Fry adds, hardly less true of the Old Testament. But when Milton said providence, he meant God. Fry believed the Bible was merely a human product. Where in his entire book did Fry personally affirm God's existence or that the Bible was revelation from God? In the very last lines of the book, page 233, there is a quizzical plus. The author wrote, the normal human reaction to a great cultural achievement like the Bible is to do with it what the Philistines did to Samson. And there's a picture of what the, of Samson uh, grinding out the wheat and so on. He's blind and all. Um, they, they reduce Samson to impotence, then, uh, then lock it in a mill to grind our aggressions and prejudice. But perhaps it's hair like Samson's, could grow again even there. And he's alluding to the fact that Samson's hair began to grow. 
This is about the only place in the book where there could be a small allowance for a miracle. Fry was thinking more of a non-divine miracle, but God is the one who allowed Samson's hair to grow and who also answered Samson's prayer for his strength to return. Though Fry did not mean this, he was willing to let readers consider either possibility, you know, maybe a divine miracle, maybe just a mer human miracle. From my perspective, Fry himself joined in with those who want to reduce the Bible to impotence, his word, and to grind his words. In his case, it was his evolutionary attack on the Bible, also known as the documentary hypothesis. Fry was, has, since writing, passed from this life. But I wonder if he now realizes that God really did create the world in six days, that he really did send a global flood, that he really did send his only son, and that he really is still waiting to receive returning repentant sinners into his outstretched arms.